Sukuma is one of several different kinds of ornamental approaches where you take a piece of material like shell, you cut a shape out and then you cut a pocket in the surface that it's going into and it'll actually be inlaid down into that pocket. I'm an actual duke, you're in the present, you can just call me your Cronus. I like to think I'm in one of the group, you know, that I'm part of that group, you know, that's up at the top, maybe pushing the limits of what Inlay can do. Guys came along like Larry Robinson and took it to a new level. The bar has just been sent way, way high. It's how I make my living. I am incapable of getting a job at this point in my career. My mother would say, doesn't that, don't you get bored? I said, I really don't. I get into, wow, no, I want the yellow and gold to really match right with this little piece of purple going through. You can't, you can't describe it to people. You know, you tell people, I, I, I build banjos, and they go, oh, yeah, right. And then you show them, and they go, oh, you build banjos. <laughs> It's kind of like getting a tattoo. Once you pick something and you get it, it means that much more to you. Yeah, okay, Bootsy Collins, a perfect example. Do you need to put on like star sunglasses? No, but it's a lot cooler when you do. You're naming it Dragons and Vines, which is a nod to all the dragons we did. There weren't any dragons in late before we showed up. I think most artists are motivated by a desire to be remembered forever. And I think it's likely that some of the, these instruments will be highly visible museum pieces for centuries to come. I'm pretty well tuned up. I guess it's as good as it needs to be tuned up for a $100,000 guitar. <laughs> I've always said that the great thing about guitars is it requires three artists. It requires Mother Nature, you know, the greatest artist of all time. It requires me, the person who builds the guitar, does the inlay work, and normally it requires the person who plays it. You know, so it's a, it's a piece of art that requires kind of a whole team of, of people. I'm not an artist by trade in terms of a pencil on a piece of paper. So I had to find other artists to do that. I mean, one of the dragons that we did was right out of uh, the movie where the Tyrannosaurus Rex is looking at the VW Bug. That's on the guitar. You know, that was the, there was a concept for it, so I was good at that. But in terms of getting out a pencil and, and drawing the thing, that wouldn't be. I think if you're into the rock and roll world, dragons have kind of a cool imagery. I don't know if there are too many rock players, for example, that can even afford one. Let's give it to them. Oh, yeah. Hey, man. To say that that Airhead spoke to a generation uh, <laughs> might be a stretch. Thank you. Hey, wait, what was that for me? Go for broke, it's on the LAPD. Oh, man. I want me a PRS guitar mm. with a dragon in life. Nice. Yeah. Just that the, the dragon guitar was associated with that, and it was hilarious, you know? Um, you know, having the dragon guitar be one of your demands if you, you know, take a, a radio station hostage or... <laughs> I think on a musical instrument, it's uh, just bigger and bolder. It wouldn't be as spectacular if it wasn't on that. That's the palette. That's that's the uh, canvas that you're working on. I was pretty hot stuff when I was doing inlay. I mean, I was doing stuff nobody did. I was using finer blades. I was doing more detail. I was uh, doing designs that nobody thought to do. But then guys came along like Larry Robinson. Um, that took what I was doing and took it to a new level, and now there's guys that take what Larry's doing, like Harvey Leach, and Harvey's doing stuff that, that Larry Robinson won't even touch. I mean, it, it, the kind of detail that Harvey's getting into is just insane. I'm, I'm not really doing a lot of inlay work where it's just a vine or something like that. It's usually something more more personal to the to customer themselves. I'm really 
adaptable and I've done a lot of different art styles and art periods. I, I love Art Nouveau, I love Japanese art, I love Celtic art. I've done a bunch of Art Deco over the years and classical Greek and, and Empire. And I, I've pretty much covered most of the art periods. I, I couldn't do that stuff. It's sort of like the Olympics, you know, every year someone beats somebody else's record. It doesn't mean the old guys were bad, it's just the new guys have finer techniques and better materials, better equipment, and, and more knowledge available, and they're just pushing the limits. In 1977, I went to work for the National Geographic Society. My assignment was to go photograph somebody that did something for a living that I didn't know. I came down here with my cameras and um, I photographed. We spent the whole day together and from that, that moment on, we were just fast friends and I would come down here anytime I could. We'd come down to visit him and he would literally have a jeweler's saw through one of his knuckles. And he'd be standing there meet, meeting us at the door with a jeweler's saw. He must have done that at least three times. And we'd say, Larry, let's go to the hospital. Is in those days that you know he cut the pearl with a very very fine jeweler saw on a band. It was a band saw, and every now and then it would break. And sometimes when it they would, break, would fly it would come off, come down, and his hand would be there, and it would go right through his finger. Larry knew that you know he needed his hands to feed his family, create a living for himself, and uh, so he saw the opportunity in the machines to not only increase production, but you know make things tighter, make things more accurate and there was, wasn't really a risk. Larry Seifel and I were very good friends, and we used to send examples of our work to each other, pictures of it, just to try to annoy each other. And Larry really liked to do the problem solving involved with CNC work, and he knew that that's where his bread and butter was going to be. He would get in some kind of jam trying to push the limits on what he could do and he'd call me and I'd just throw out crazy ideas. Like if I threw out enough of those things, it would give him money. He'd say, you know, that won't work, but that gave me an idea of what I could do and he'd go try it and it would work. So we kind of had that synergy. What Larry Seifel did for this business was fundamentally decide that you could do it with computers, not with hand saws. And he came to my shop, he said, I'm going to change the inlay business. We're going to go with computers and I want you to be a part of it and right at the forefront. I went, it's a deal. I didn't even think about it. I remember we went out to lunch and made a deal and it was done, it was over. He says, I'm gonna take, the exact words was, I'm gonna take Italy into the 21st century. That's what his idea was. I think Larry Seifel recognized that with the technology that he had developed, that he could accomplish things that were incomprehensible. I call them approximations of impossibilities, where a person would look at a particular inlay and say, and not even know how it was remotely possible to achieve uh, that level of detail. I spent a lot of time at Larry's shop in Maryland uh, um, in the middle of the night, down under the deck, uh, looking out over Seifel Creek, which Seifel Creek, by the way, actually has petrified mother of pearl shells in the rock if you walk down there. We were like soul brothers, and it was it was a crushing blow when he died. The Siphon Lights guy uh, developed from Larry and I's uh, relationship. Uh, Larry and I worked together as I was a designer at PRS. I worked with Larry. I remember it really started with working on the Dragon guitars. It was about Pro Works. It was about Larry. It was about Gene. And. It seemed to represent Larry, and that was the main core. That's that's really why I love working in this industry. I've. Uh, never seen a, a big organization that has such a familial connection with one another. Even though we may be competing in business, there's very little ill will. Um, we're, we're all in this together in a way, so that's what makes it special to me. I admire just about everybody out there that's doing inlay work. 
you know, because it's a little different than what I do. There's always something that they've done that is a little more creative than you may have thought of at the time. You know, you go, oh, wow, you know, I, and then of course you steal that and use that next time on your next inlay. You know. But fortunately in the inlay business, that's kind of accepted, you know. It's a matter of um, getting on top of this mountain and then seeing another mountain that's a little bit higher and then saying, well, can I get to the top of that mountain? And you get to the top of that mountain and, you know, over across the valley, you see another one yet even higher. So you're always trying to better your game. The question of what's next, I don't know. And I'm looking forward to it because I know someone's going to produce something spectacular and then it's up to us to figure out how to cut it down into a little part and get it into a fingerboard. So 